this is the beginning of the second retreat. Those of you who are continuing on from the first can renew your eight precepts. And for those who uh, have just come, I will go through these eight precepts again and then give them to you formally. Can you hear? Is it all set up for your... You're all wired up? Yes, I am. Now, for those of you who were on the previous retreat, it's a good time also to reflect on just the, the form of the eight precepts as a, uh, you know, to see how it, to see what you've learned from it so far. Now we're using the, for the meditation retreat, what the kind of precepts that are conducive towards uh, spiritual development, uh, in which your your say your your attention is directed inward rather than say your attention being pulled outward all the time. Now, most of the time, our the the our lives are constant kind of being pulled out of ourselves to look at this, listen to that, read, watch television, eat, talk with people, and our mind is, is being pulled outward into objects. Like if you go sightseeing, you feel your attention always being pulled out by the scenery. You listen to music or talk, chat, read books, all this, your, your uh, consciousness is being absorbed into objects of sense. Now for meditation, we're, say, the goal of our practice for Buddhist meditation is Nibbana. Now Nibbana, or Nirvana, sounds terribly uh, kind of exotic or impossible for those of you who might have read about it in a book or heard the word but what it really means is the unconditioned which is something that we we don't look for outside we won't be able to see it with our eye or it, it's not a sound that you hear with the organ of your ear or smell, taste, touch or create with your mind So, the practice of inclining to Nibbāna means that we, we uh, prepare ourselves in a way in which our senses will be as little, uh, unnec- will be unnecessarily have, uh, stimulated, in which we will be able to say, concentrate our attention, compose ourselves on our, what's going on inside our mind. So our meditation practice is more like an inner listening, listening, watching. So we want as little kind of sensory distraction as possible just for this 10-day retreat. So we, we don't watch television, listen to the radio, we don't read books, we keep a noble silence, and we, we uh, don't, uh, we don't, we don't have to talk or entertain each other with fascinating, interesting conversations. We don't have to uh, uh, seek each other for romantic affairs. We, don't, we aren't getting caught up in playing games. We aren't going to play football, tennis, ping pong or anything. Bridge, <laughs> chess, poker. <laughs> we 
we're not going to to eat all day long without a certain designated meal time and so we don't have to go around trying to look for something to eat and uh, refrain from going to the pub or the beer hall or taking um, drugs such as marijuana, heroin and opium, LSD, these kind of things. Things, drugs that uh, we could easily escape, uh, get our consciousness off into when we get bored with looking at what's going on in, in our mind. Sometimes when you have to sit with yourself without anything to do, it can be pretty um, rather uh, miserable. <laughs> To have to be with your own mind for a while. Okay. You'd rather be with somebody else's mind or something that is more interesting than our own particular habits and conditions. But in this practice also we're developing a firm patience and ability to endure. So we have to endure things that before we wouldn't endure where we would tend to run away and escape into something else. Now, we're going to try to at least endure a little longer. We're going to stay in certain postures, so that we're not going to try to seek comfort all the time, but just sitting comfortably, but not luxuriously, sleeping, but not uh, just escaping into sleep all the time, certain times to sleep, sitting, standing, walking, basic postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. We're going to practice the concentration on our own breath, normal breath, recognizing our postures of sitting, standing, walking, lying down, and keeping these precepts. Now, the first, when I give these precepts, it's in the Pali language, so I will explain them to you so that you will know what you're saying, what you're vowing. And so, first of all, we, we chant the, the salutation to the Buddha, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Samma Samputasa, which means a kind of praise, salutation to the Arahant, the Blessed One. It's a traditional Theravada kind of salutation before anything begins. Then you take the three refuges. And this is what this is a, the traditional way of of um, being a Buddhist is taking the three refuges: Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. I take refuge in Buddha, in the Dhamma, and in the Sangha. Say, Bhutang Sanangachami, Tamang Sanangachami, Sankang Sanangachami. Saranang Kachami means refuge. And Bhutang Tamang Sankang, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So taking refuge in Buddha, you say Bhutang Saranang Kachami, this is your taking refuge in wisdom. Now, taking refuge in wisdom means <coughs> using wisdom. So this is the whole point of this retreat, really, is to use wisdom in it. Not to just kind of sit here in a habitual manner and wait for something to kind of zap you from outside and enlighten you, but it's to uh, for you to arouse wisdom in your practice during this time. So taking refuge in Buddha means to, it's a very practical thing, it's not just a, a kind of exotic uh, oriental uh, phrase in which you repeat just uh, for the sake of tradition, it actually has an important meaning. It's a reflection, a recollection for you to remind yourself to be wise, to take refuge in wisdom. Then, uh, Tamang Theranangachami, Dhamma, is the truth. The, the 
the word Dhamma or Dharma, the ultimate reality. Now that's not something separate either. So when you take refuge in Dhamma, you're not exactly taking refuge in some belief in a supreme being, but in the truth here and now, because the Dhamma, the ultimate truth, is imminent now. So it's a verbal recognition of the ultimate reality that is, that is imminent now in, in all of us. So that the Dhamma or the ultimate truth, the Buddha is the personification of wisdom, and Dhamma has no personification, has no personal qualities. Buddha, you see, they can make Buddha images. They can make them look like human beings. Like, see, this little image here is shaped like a, a human being. They can't make Dharma images. They can't make a, a Dharma... Well, you, they use symbols like wheels or uh, various symbols that kind of mean Dharma, but they're never personifications. They're, never, they're not beings of any sort. Then Sankang Sarnangachami in the Sangha means Sangha means those who practice the, the Dhamma, those who live by the Dhamma, those who take refuge in the Buddha. Dhamma that like you and like myself, human beings, men and women who practice the teaching of the Buddha are called the Sangha. The Sangha means those who practice virtue, who live a good life practicing what is good doing good, refraining from doing evil, who are sincere in what they're doing, and earnest. Uh, so you're taking refuge in that, in yourself also, which is sincere and good and earnest, not that in you which is foolish, uh, worried, frightened, greedy, and so forth. You're not taking refuge in those things. You're taking refuge in a practical way, reminding yourself to, to use courage, goodness, uh, diligence, all these for your practice of meditation. In practical situations as being a human being living here at this, in this place, in this country. So Sankang Sarnangachami means taking refuge in that in yourself which is virtuous and good. <coughs> so the refuges are merely ways of reminding ourselves to seek our refuge in wisdom, truth and virtue. Rather than seeking our refuge, people generally seek refuge now in Swiss banks, <laughs> in modern technology, refuge in others, seeking safety or security and some kind of uh, relationship to someone else. Seeking refuge in, in uh, worries. People will just spend all day worrying. But these are all very inadequate refuges. They're not, like, they're not refuges. Refuges are safe places to be and those aren't safe. They always lead to despair, sorrow, death. So the three refuges of the Buddhist are, they are truly refuges, places of safety. Now the eight precepts begin with uh, Banadi Bhat, which means refrain from intentionally killing anyone. So during these next ten days, if you'll kindly refrain from killing anybody here. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you'll break break the precept. <laughs> but also, it means uh, intentionally killing a uh, being. So, don't kill the rats, the ants, the flies, the cats, or any other. So refrain from intentionally killing. <clears throat> then the second is refraining from taking anything that is not given. So, not to steal, not to take, not even to look at, uh, touch other people's possessions. So, you know, just remember to kind of 
not to just leave things alone unless you you know there's something that you really need and ask for it or if it's yours or if it's part of the community but to refrain from even like if you're sharing rooms to to just borrow or take things that belong to other people even though you have no intention of stealing just refrain from just touching things that belong to others it's good practice then uh, the third is refraining from any kind of sexual conduct, erotic behavior, intentional kind of con uh, erotic behavior, so that uh, we'll keep uh, the vow of celibacy during this next uh, ten days. In the the fourth is refraining from. Um, using vain speech, lying, gossip, and so forth. But this will be noble silence, so it's, uh, it's a... Uh, that one is quite well covered. So, but noble silence doesn't it means that you can speak if, like if, if when I ask you a question, <laughs> you, you can answer it. <laughs> When they have an interview or something, you can talk to me. If the house catches on fire, you can yell for help. <laughs> if you have if you have a problem with anything and you you need something, then you can talk to Martina. And or who's the? I'm allowed to talk to you. Or who's the? Maria, better. Maria. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but don't don't go and just use any old excuse to talk to Maria. <laughs> uh, then uh, also remember noble signing <coughs> that. Uh, people are trying to keep it so but sometimes it's very difficult if somebody else talks to us we have to be very we feel that we're rude if we don't answer so you remember to be responsible for not drawing somebody into conversation that maybe they they really don't want to be part of but which you might unconsciously do that and respect the rights of those around you and their attempts to keep silent Watch the impulse to want to talk, because speaking, talking is a great release of a lot of uh, repressed feelings. So, like when people in ordinary life uh, have a lot to complain about. Complaining is, is a way of releasing tension. So that when we, when we can't complain about something, when we're, we're quiet, we find maybe all these tensions are rising. <laughs> So, and that's what you want. You want them. You want to look at these things rather than just habitually, um, uh, just follow the habits of your lifetime. You want to see the way your mind works and what you've been doing uh, during your life, so you can understand. So that we we're limiting ourselves in this way, so that we can't just follow habit. We have to kind of stop and say, "Well, I can't do that now. I've taken these precepts." So, and then watch what happens so that you begin to observe the conditions of your mind and let them go so that you're, through mindfulness you're letting things go in a skillful way rather than just a habitual, heedless way you're learning how to skillfully let things go rather than just habitually repress and carry on in ways that, that keep uh, binding us to suffering. Then the fifth precept is to refrain from taking drugs uh, like the hallucinogenic drugs and, and uh, addictive drugs and drink like spirit, spirits and alcohol and so forth. Then um, this is so that you're the people 
also let off a lot of repression through drinking. <coughs> One way, I suppose Switzerland is as much people drink as much as they do in England. Uh, people have to drink because uh, alcohol allows you to uh, say all the things you wouldn't dare say when you're sober. <laughs> <laughs> so that in, in uh, all societies, everywhere in the world, drinking is an important kind of part of it. it really, it's kind of a safety valve for most people in which they they can kind of relax and then say and act in ways that they wouldn't dare be able to do if they were not inebriated or under the influence of alcohol or drugs. But now we are trying to release tensions and repression through wisdom and watching rather than <coughs> drinking drugs is unskillful. It just uh, makes you addicted and caught up, and you don't get any wisdom from it. Then the 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 last three, the the, the sixth precept is vikala uh, pochana, which means uh, regarding food, be more disciplined in regards to food. So that just accept the meat, the food that is offered at the designated times, rather than seeking food, going to restaurants, uh, having supplies of food, munching away on this and that. <laughs> so that you can, don't spend your time just looking for distraction through eating. That's another way that we distract ourselves when we get bored, depressed, is to start eating things. So, accept just the, the food that's given here, and uh, watch your mind. The food has been superb, actually. <laughs> it's hard to watch one's mind when watching the food. <laughs> <coughs> then the um, the next one is a long one. Nadakita washita with sukatasana malagantha vile banatarana mantana vipusnatana. That's not English. <laughs> and that's to refrain from dancing, singing, playing games, uh, wearing cosmetics, and spending your time having your hair curled. Polishing your nails. <laughs> Dressing up in in uh, fancy dress and so forth. Refrain from getting involved in in uh, that kind of activity and uh, game playing. So this is the kind of the one that you can't you can't do anything fun rule. <laughs> <laughs> so that you <laughs> you're not allowed to have a good time here. <laughs> and then the last one, Mahasaya Ujjasana Mahasana is refraining from uh, sleeping in inappropriate times, seeking uh, to escape through sleeping on high luxurious beds or extreme comfort, so that you're uh, just accept the sleep, sleeping uh, place you've been given and uh, try not to spend the day sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep is another way out of everything, isn't it? One of the, our favorite ways is to just crash out and forget. If you can't eat, you can't sing and dance, you, you can't uh, have sex, you can't take drugs, you can't do anything, then you can go to sleep at least. <laughs> <laughs> So there's eight precepts, so are you sure you want to take these? (laughs) (laughs) 
But this is the form. It's a renunciate form. <coughs> it's for what they call samanas. Uh, samanas are are those who are intending towards the spiritual goal. So samana are are precepts are to always say guide one to contain one's desires to direct that energy that would go out into these other things towards spiritual development. So the eight precepts, like a container, it kind of holds you, keeps you from going out every which way. Like living here together, many people in one building, we can live very easily with each other because we're not, we're not demanding very much from each other. And so we have time for spiritual practice. If we were, if we had, if we didn't have the precepts, then it would be each person wanting to do what he or she wanted to do, which would affect. If we couldn't agree on on the form we were going to use, we'd have just chaos, anarchy. This person would want to do this, and this person want to do that, and there'd be arguments, quarrels. Who would have time for a meditation? <laughs> So we, we all, all of us, agree to follow, contain ourselves within this form uh, so that we can all live at uh, this time together uh, and support each other in our spiritual life. Because not many, most people don't have an opportunity to spend, say, ten days uh, just inclining to Nibbana, to developing their spiritual life. As you well know, in lay life, this so many things pulling you out into the worldly conditions all the time. So here we're trying to create an atmosphere and give you the opportunity to where you're not having to, the, 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 the kind of tensions and demands made on you are not the kind that will be, be pulling you out, but they will be the kind that will be encouraging you to look inward to watch, be aware. Uh, Ursi, could you ask for the eight precepts? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Mayam bante di saranena saha atasilani yachana. Tutiampi mayam bante di saranena saha atasilani yachana. Tatiampi mayam bante di saranena saha atasilani yachana. Now, if you put your hands together, prepare for the eight precepts. Repeat after me. Namo tassa. Namo tassa. Bhagavato. Arahato. Sama sambutasa. Namo tassa. Bhagavato. Arahato. Sama Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samputasa Bhutan Sarananga Chami Dhammang Sarananga Chami Sankham Sarananga Chami Duti Yampi Bhutan Sarananga Chami Duti Yampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Duti Yampi Sankang Sarananga Chami Tati Yampi 
Tatiyampi Bhutang Saranang Chami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranang Chami Tatiyampi Sankhang Saranang Chami So now you have taken the three refuges and now the precepts Banadi Bata Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Adinadana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Abramacharya Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Mutsavata Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Sura Meraya Machabama Tatana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Vikala Pochana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Najakita Vatita Vitsuka Tasana Malakanta Vilebana Tarana Mantana Vipusana Tana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Ujasayana Mahasayana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhyami Imani Atta Sikabadani Samadhyami There Or in the in the uh, form of the, you're now in the Samana vehicle. You're riding in the Samana vehicle. <laughs> a vehicle is like a car, isn't it? Like you, to carry you somewhere, so that you're, you, if you, if you, <coughs> if you have a good vehicle, then you can kind of depend on it, and you don't have to spend your time doing all kinds of things or getting lost on the path you just put yourself in a good vehicle and then it takes you to where you're going and, and you just can sit and watch so now you're in this eight precept vehicle now now the real practice is to sit and watch stand and watch walk and watch lay down and watch be mindful and now the vehicle itself, you don't have to, don't, whether you like it or not doesn't matter, whether you approve of it, all of it, it doesn't matter, because you're watching your mind. You're not, it's not up to you to, to try to get the, say if you're riding in a, in a, in a Renault or, or a, something in the use, I don't want a Renault, I want a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes. Just, just ride in this one that you're in now. And see if it see if it gets you anywhere. <laughs> and thinking I'd rather have another one. If you do think that, then watch that. Recognize the conditions of your mind, the discontentment, the struggle, the resistance. Now, in any kind of restrictive form, there's going to be natural resistance to it. When you're in in uh, say keeping precepts, keeping silent. We have a schedule. You get up in the morning and and then sit for, and then do these various things. Everything is kind of ordered and 
uh, everything is itemized. And they do this at this time, this time at that time. And so there's resistance to that too. So recognize, you want to look at that resistance. You want to recognize that. It's only for ten days. So you have a chance to watch suffering and the, how the mind kind of resists authority or a structure imposed over it. Now this is important because we need to uh, learn to surrender, to relax, to let go. As long as this, the form is not based on any kind of exploitive or evil actions. So you're not asked to, you, you're all based on morality, on what is considered moral by wise people in the, in the world. So that we're, we're not, you'll not be asked to do anything that would be immoral or evil, or cruel, or anything like this. If, if, if our Venerable Nanda asks you to kill somebody, steal something, then you say, I'm sorry, Venerable Sumato, <laughs> I would break my precepts if I did. So it's, your, it's kind of your protection from, the, from, from unscrupulous gurus. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we ask you to break your precepts, you say, no. <laughs> that's your, that's your, that's your uh, guideline, you're right. And so the rest of it, like the meditation, the, the schedule, all this is based on the precepts to, to keep that form. So, what, you know, what you do now is watch your mind. Like, like any feeling of resentment of authority or being told what to do or having to conform to something that you didn't design yourself. And we have to conform our activities to something imposed on us from, from someone else. Some, we feel a resistance or aversion arising. When we, like sitting in meditation, when you can't, when you, when you can't get up when you want to, or so forth, you feel aversion arising. Uh, sometimes we resent, uh, like I used to feel that a lot in Thailand uh, when I went to uh, stay with Ajahn Chah. He used to make me sit for hours like this. It was kind of, the Thais like to sit in this, this polite posture. In my, and I found it very uh, painful to sit like this for five minutes. And, he used to make us sit for something like two or three hours like that. And my knees would be... I'd be going, uh, getting really angry. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, I noticed that, that I, I directed that anger at him. I used to sit there and I used to just <coughs> feel such hatred for him. <laughs> and then I would think, I'm not going to stay here. I don't have to do this. I'll show him. I'm going to leave. <laughs> but I didn't. I watched that. I watched that kind of aversion and anger. Well, pain. When you're in pain, you get angry. If you can't, if you know, or when you're in a put in a, a position where you can't do what you want, or you feel you can't do, or you, you're, you're afraid of what others will think, or you're trying to, you know, there's so many things here that we can learn from, from living in a, in a community, from having authority figures, monks and lay people, from having disciplined rules and a, and a disciplined life. Where and where we can't get drunk, can't complain about things, we can't uh, distract ourselves with television or games. And we come and we sit together, stand together, walk together, eat together, and all this. But we we watch. So we we're bringing our attention to our mind, what goes on inside us, because we're trying to watch what happens to us. 
rather than just follow habit, you're studying habit, you're watching it, listening to it. So you begin to have a perspective on the conditioning that you've acquired <coughs> up to now. So this form isn't just a kind of reconditioning process. We're not trying to make you into Buddhists or into any, we're not trying to make you believe in anything. There's nothing that you have to believe in. Like the three refuges of Buddha Dhamma Thang isn't a belief, it's a practical kind of statement of one's intentions to be wise, to use wisdom, to take refuge in what is the truth and in virtue. But it's not a kind it's not a like Buddhist belief. So you're not asked to believe in Buddha or believe in any kind of Buddhist teachings, but to take the teachings and use them in order to watch and learn and listen. So the Buddhist meditation teachings are all uh, designed to kind of get you to look at yourself. Ways of perceiving, ways of watching, so that you begin to understand that the Buddha wisdom is a simple wisdom that all that arises passes away. And if it arises and passes away, it's not yours. It's not what you are. You're not a condition that arises and passes away. And then you say, well then what am I? And this is the ultimate question. <coughs> Maybe by the end of the retreat or somewhere you might actually begin to know who you are. <laughs> but you have to only, you can only know who you are when you know what you're not. So we start then we start with ex examining what we are not. And this is what we're doing when we're seeing the, the, the conditions of our bodies and minds, feelings, thoughts, memories, opinions, views, all these are conditioned. They're conditioned into you. They're not ultimate realities. They're conditioned into you by the, your society, families. So that they're where we take them quite, we quite believe in them as being our personalities, ourselves. Now we're looking at them not as our personal kind of possessions, but as percep conditioned perceptions. We're breaking through this habitual grasping of perception to understand the truth, to begin to recognize the ultimate truth. which is always here now, but which we don't recognize because we're so busy with all these conventional things. Caught up in our feelings, in our emotions, in our uh, habits, likes and dislikes, and uh, fears, doubts and worries. Who has time to ever recognize anything other than just being caught up in the momentum of habit? Until you take time, you have to make the time, you have to turn to the truth. You have to make that, it doesn't, the truth doesn't come and, and zap you. Not just truth, like God standing up there and saying, wake up you so and so. <laughs> <laughs> you have to turn, you have to look, you have to listen, you have to put forth the effort yourself. So that's what we mean by practice uh, meditation, being mindful. Mindfulness is really a turning to the truth. It's not a rejection of the world. It's not that you're going to pass judgment on the world and reject it and say, I don't, I don't want anything more to do with the world. Don't like it. <laughs> and go off and live in a kind of special celestial realm. That's what, that doesn't happen. But you're seeing the world as it really is, rather than as you perceive it, as you've been conditioned to perceive the world. You're using wisdom rather than desire. 
in your life. All of you have wisdom. There's not one person here that is lacking wisdom. It's just a matter of using that is all. So in meditation we're using wisdom. We're not acquiring it. It's not something you get through meditation. It's something you use to meditate with. Now meditation is a completely different attitude is necessary than the worldly attitudes you've, you have in your mind. Like when you, you come here, you, you have your mind's conditioned to say, think in all the attitudes of your, of your worldly habits, which might be alright for worldly conditions, but, do not, but are obstacles for Dhamma, for the truth. So take the, the worldly habit of thinking, if I practice now hard, then sometime in the future I will become something. It's like going to university. If I study diligently in three or four years, I will attain my university degree, which is true on a conventional level, isn't it? You have, you, we all have been through that. You don't start out with a university degree. Mm-hmm. You start <laughs> with doing something and going along for a few years to attain it. That's, that's the world. That's the, the world of birth and death, of division, of discrimination. Now, the, 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 attitude, so the attitude of a worldly person is one of doing something and expecting a result in the future. So that worldly people are always expecting things. They think, I have to do this now. I have to get rid of my lazy habits, and I have to get rid of all my bad things in order to become this kind of saint in the future. So, we oftentimes live our lives in this kind of, always trying to get rid of things. We see weaknesses, faults, uh, fears, and all this, and we're trying to get rid of those things because they're, they're inhibiting, causing us so that uh, a lot of misery uh, blocking us in our pursuit of happiness or success, worldly success. So in, in order to be really happy, you have to get rid of unhappiness. And this is the worldly attitude. Now the Dharma attitude of, for meditation is, rather than doing something now to attain something in the future, it's, it's a being like being wise now, using wisdom now, not doing, not meditating now, hopefully to gain wisdom by the end of the retreat. 
<laughs> That's the world here. That doesn't help really. What you need to take, develop to just now reflect on this attitude of now being using wisdom, meaning being aware, looking at the conditions that you that arise in your consciousness. Now, be using wisdom now doesn't mean you're going to become wise in the future. It means you're being wise now. So it's an attitude of being rather than of becoming. So Buddhist meditation is a very direct kind of practice. It's even being enlightened now. And you think, if you read Buddhist books too much, you think, oh, I would. There's no chance for enlightenment in this lifetime. You have to. It's so difficult to do that. You know, you'll probably have to be reborn. I don't know how many more times before you'll ever get even near to it. That's how books tend to make it sound. And even in countries like Thailand and Sri Lanka, they talk like that. Some monks in Thailand will even say, there's no point in even trying now. The, the day is gone. The, the day, that era where people were enlightened is, is over. Now that this is the Kali Yuga. This, we can only just hope to be maybe reborn again in, in, a, in a Deva realm or something. So the people, monks, when Ajahn Chah would hear this, hear monks talk like this. He said, well then why did you ordain? Why did you ordain as a monk? Because when you ordain as a monk, you say, I ordain as a monk to go to Nibbana. So it's a direct thing. You're going, inclining to Nibbana. The whole point of monastic life, of a Buddhist monk, is to incline to Nibbana. It's not to be reborn in the next life as a Devada. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a, where traditional religion is really, uh, you know, has lost the spirit, has lost the essence of Buddhist teaching. Because it makes it sound too difficult, too remote a possibility. Something that takes lifetimes of being reborn into this and that before you can ever possibly be enlightened. But if you really understand Buddhist teaching, it's not it's not, Buddha didn't teach like that at all. It, it's not becoming enlightened, it's being enlightened. So it's always being. It's not finding Buddhas, but being Buddha. Being wisdom. It's not thinking you're Buddha. But it's being that Buddha wisdom. This is a completely different, mind-blowing attitude <coughs> to, to Western mind. You think, well, I have to do all kinds, I've got these, I've got a bad temper, I'm greedy, I'm, I have a lot of fear, and how can I be a Buddha if I have all these things? I've got terrible habits, I've done some really wretched things in the past, and, uh, you know, how can I, how can I ever hope to be a Buddha when I've got so many faults and weaknesses? So you think like that, you know, it seems hopeless. But being Buddha means being that knowing, knowing those those thoughts as thoughts. Those feelings that you somehow have so many faults, so many weaknesses, so many defects that you couldn't possibly hope to ever get near to it in this lifetime. You recognize that's conditioned perception, that's thinking, and that's being Buddha. Buddhas know that conditions as the conditions. That's all. Buddhas are very simple beings. It's that knowing that the conditions of your mind are conditions of your mind. It's not believing that those conditions are yours anymore. So you, what you think you are is not, is a condition. It's not, is a condition of your mind. It's thought. It's not any, it's not the ultimate truth. It's not Buddha. <coughs> So in meditation, Buddhist meditation is that direct. It's actually a being, <coughs> being awake, being mindful, listening, being attentive. 
So, like we sit and we, when we meditate, we, we are going out, playing games, reading books, dancing, singing, drinking, sleeping, chatting, going out hunting, skiing, fishing, but we're sitting looking like we sit here and we can shut our eyes, we don't, we don't have anything to look at. Not much, <laughs> Nobody's dressing up to make themselves incredibly alluring, so that there's no, nobody to really worth looking at now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Venerable Nando I sitting there aren't worth looking at. <laughs> so there's nothing to bother to look at but yourself. So you're sitting here looking, watching, listening, being attentive to whatever comes, whatever happens. We don't, it doesn't matter what it is. If it moves and changes, it's, it's, you're aware of it. If it's good, pleasant, or if it's uh, horrible or nasty, uh, if it's a good feeling, if it's, if it's a murderous feeling, like you want to murder me, that's all right. You still just recognize it as a condition. Don't do it because you've got the precepts. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have to give these precepts. <laughs> so that you, if you feel like murdering me, just recognize that as a feeling. Let it go. Don't, don't do it. All these things you're 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 uh, you're free to think. What you what you want, or what comes up, not what you want, but what comes up. Allow your your opening the mind to allow things to just appear. Things that before you know under certain conditions you think, oh, I shouldn't be thinking like that. You're thinking maybe maybe Ajahn Sumedho can read minds. And you think I'm sitting up here reading everything that's going through your mind, <laughs> but I can't read mine, so you don't have to worry about. It. <laughs> so whatever, whatever comes up in your mind is you. Only you know, and that's for you to know that that is a condition. Just to recognize conditions as conditions, you don't have to figure out why do I think like that, why do I have thoughts like that. Uh, and then you start to think, well, because when I was a child, my mother dropped me on my head. And <laughs> the concussion always made me, I've always resented that, and that, because now I have this problem. And you just think about yourself again, don't you? So you're, you well, this is just bare attention on conditions. One time... Uh, in uh, London, a woman used to, when we lived in uh, Hampstead, a woman that used to come there almost every night. She was a middle-aged English woman who who liked to think of herself as a kind of mother, earth mother, a very maternal kind of woman. And she always, you know, the image she had of herself is one that was always loving everybody. So she, she would always talk about love and loving everything. <clears throat> and then one day she came to the Bihara in London and she was really upset. And she said, I'm really, it's terrible. She said, I don't know what's going on, what's happened to me. And then my, my daughter-in-law, my son's wife, just had a baby, and the first grandchild. And I went to see the baby for the first time and I picked it up and this thought came to mind, I want to poke its eyes out. And she said, I was so horrified by this thought that I, I had to leave. And she said, why would I think a thought like that? What's wrong? What's, what's wrong with me that I would think something like that? And I said, you didn't do it, did you? <laughs> and she said, well, no, of course not. <laughs> well, it's just a thought that comes. <laughs> If you try to think out why would I think you start analyzing, just recognize that the condition is a thought. The thought is a condition. 
It's something you don't do. If you have thoughts like that, just don't act on them. Let them go. But also, it's obvious, isn't it? Someone that's trying so desperately to be maternal is obviously trying to cover up a lot of hostility. <laughs> but then, you know, then she'll stay. If I told her that, she'd start try, start <coughs> thinking about herself as, or, a lot, which she already does too much. Thinks about herself and tries to figure herself out all the time. <clears throat> Where the, the real help comes in recognizing conditions and letting them go, not creating complicated complications around things. Recognize that you might have evil thoughts, but just you don't act on them. It's something you refrain from doing. So if you want to steal something, don't go spend the time worrying about being a thief, but just recognize that that's something you don't do. <coughs> uh, sexual thoughts, just recognize those are conditions of the mind rather than personal problems. All these things, you're recognizing conditions of the mind as conditions rather than as personal problems, personality problems, as me and mine, as a, a neurotic hang-up, as a terrible fault and flaw with me, me and mine. You're not you're not, don't do that, don't fall for that anymore, but recognize. So then it's a, a genuine opening of the mind, so that you feel a freedom to let these things come up into consciousness. Because there's a lot that we do not allow ourselves to consciously, uh, to, to arise in our consciousness. We have a kind of repressive mechanism, that there's a lot that we have to keep away all the time. We can't, can't we, we won't allow it to come into consciousness. Now, be con conscious of something means to allow something to come up so you see it directly when you're fully conscious of it. But say hatred, uh, lust, things like this, a lot of it, we just we never allow into our consciousness. It only comes when we're when we're completely heedless, like drunk or asleep or something. When you're when you're asleep, you have oftentimes weird, horrible dreams, don't you? Where I mean, really, awful things happen uh, because you you're not you're not holding you're not filtering you're not repressing anything. So in in sleep, what you wouldn't be able to allow in consciousness arises in dreams. It's a release, also. It's a because it, otherwise, you know, if you don't, they did, I think, experiments one time where they'd wake people just before they started dreaming, and they became very, very neurotic. <laughs> 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 they couldn't get through their dreams, which are a relief, you think. But now, in meditation, <coughs> you're, you're releasing the irrational, repressed conditions by bringing, by, in a skillful way by allowing them to come into consciousness and letting them go. So that's why the Buddhist teaching of anatta or not-self is so helpful, because if you don't, if you think these are yours, then of course there's a lot of things you just couldn't bear to, to identify with, of thoughts and feelings that you just, you know, you, if you thought, was that, is that what you really are, you'd think you were a really horrible being. <laughs> but when you can recognize it's just consciousness it's in consciousness sensory consciousness is not a person not a self it's a condition in nature that is not you not your not your not what you are then you're not afraid to allow repressed repressed things come, uh, to arise into consciousness because when you do that you let them go it's the catharsis, the kind of release or purification of the mind. <coughs> but it's skillful because it's done with wisdom, not with desire or repression. It's done. It's, it's done with so that is always wisdom is the is is being used, and it take and it takes you to the truth. All these things as you begin to 
purify the mind, relieve it of all its repressions, open it, cleanse it, you 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 know the true thing. You become you are your true nature, your true self. Which is not conditioned, the unconditioned. So <clears throat> That's why in in what happens here is don't be is like be quite brave. Allow things it's a it's an opening, a liberating, even though on one level it looks terribly restrictive, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't talk. <laughs> you're being contained physically and verbally, mentally you're being freed. Physically, you can't do this. You can't do that. Verbally, you can't. If you if you hate if you hate somebody, you can't say it, but you can recognize it. So that it's not you're not doing anything to hurt anyone else, right? But you're not repressing it. So if you hate anybody here, just don't say it. Don't say I hate you. But bring it up into consciousness. Recognize. Hatred is a condition, and, and then it let it go. So that uh, you're letting go of aversion <coughs> and hatred without creating <coughs> more habits around it. When you're willing to do that, then your karmic patterns begin to cease. Your habitual you know, hang-ups, your obsessions, all these begin to cease, they begin to fade away. You begin to feel a relief of not being, and, and begin to recognize that you're, that uh, the kind of the joy that comes from liberation, of not being just a bound, limited, conditioned creature of habit, a helpless victim of fate. Now, how many of you here have feel that your lives uh, you're just kind of hopeless, or that there's that you're too limited or you're or that you maybe you've ruined your life or that your life is pointless and so they have this is very strong in people because they have not they've not used wisdom so in in the in the talks that I give and in the meditation is all to encourage you I can't make you use wisdom it's something you have you have to use. I can't give you wisdom. It's something you have to use, and you do it by by uh, watching and listening, <coughs> recognizing, being very very patient, humble, humility, very willing to learn from even the nastiest conditions in your mind. willing to learn the ultimate truth through the most humble kind of conditions or the rather than thinking I've got to have everything I've got to have the best teacher the best conditions for me I'm the kind of conceit isn't it I have to have the very best of everything <laughs> but say here just see what what you can do under the conditions you find yourself How many of you have, have have you all practiced meditation before? I think so. Is there anyone who's never done any? <coughs> so you're all old hands. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it easier. (laughs) (laughs) 
So now if you'll just kind of stretch your legs and a bit, we'll have a sitting meditation. Yeah. <laughs>